There have been some pretty dumb things happening lately in the world of media and entertainment. HBO renamed its premium streaming service after your childhood dog. Our business daddy took its content purge up a notch and just <laughs> threw the whole HBO out. And yet they still have to license popular shows to Netflix just to stay afloat. Millennial institutions of music taste making have shuttered or been put on life support. Disney Plus is removing beloved shows faster than it can buffer up a new Lion King prequel about Mufasa. And Warner Brothers shelved Coyote vs. Acme, which was beloved by test audiences. A slap in the face the filmmaker opened up about on social media. And this all recalls two years ago when they did the same thing to Batgirl. But hey, don't worry, um, because Hollywood is going to give us four different yet interconnected Beatles biopics in 2027, which makes me want to vomit to the tune of Let It Be. Do let us know who your favorite Beatle is in the comments. Let's fight it out and see who's best. Shouts to anyone that rides for Ringo. These offenses might feel like distinct, bizarre, or just plain bad choices made by people who earn more in a month than you're gonna make in your whole life. But they all have one thing in common. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. The finance industry is behind so many of the problems plaguing today's media landscape that it's hard to figure out how this all started. So today, we're gonna look at how Wall Street took over Hollywood, how it's devastated our culture, and how they're coming for a lot more than just your favorite websites and shows. And hopefully, uh, hopefully we don't get acquired by private equity while, while filming this video. So what a black swan, half of America's daily newspapers, Shakira's music catalog, Reese Witherspoon's production company, The Onion, Insidious, Insidious 2, uh, Daddy Daycare, and Wiz Khalifa's Black and Yellow all have in common. I'm kind of curious about that myself. <laughs> well, they're all owned by Wall Street financial institutions, like the Vanguard Group, an investment advisor with about $7.7 .7 trillion in assets globally, including holding the largest stake in Disney, Comcast, NBC Universal, and Verizon, and the second largest stake in CBS and Netflix. Now, much of today's media is created under the watchful eye of Wall Street, where in 2021 alone, private equity firms funneled $1.38 billion into streaming platforms. Meanwhile, an activist investor who controls a $3.6 billion stake in Disney failed, but he got damn close to throwing his money around to stop Disney from being so damn woke. Because he thinks Black Panther, one of the most successful movies they've ever made, is too woke. And a private equity firm just bid $11 billion to buy Paramount, presumably for the sheer love of film. Even indie darlings like A24, producer of films like Everything Everywhere All at Once and Uncut Gems, has moved to producing more IP-driven projects, and coincidentally also just landed a major equity investment. This is all indicative of a very boring sounding word that's had very unboring consequences. Financialization, i.e. the staggering growth of the finance industry, both in scope and power. Like another boring sounding word that's had very unboring consequences, probably like fellatio. The foundation for finance's growth was laid by years of deregulation, beginning in 1978 when the capital gains tax cap was slashed almost in half. It would continue to shrink substantially. Capital gains is the money you make when you sell an asset, meaning that the tax rate on a stock that you've held for over a year is certainly gonna be lower than how much you get taxed on your Arby's paycheck. Arby's, we have the meat. This incentivized participation in the stock market while also siphoning billions of dollars out of America's tax revenue. But hey, it was worth it for the fun show, right? The 80s and 90s were, as we've discussed before, a veritable orgy of financial deregulation that encouraged bigger, riskier, and more speculative financial dealings. This led to the Hulk-like emergence of, among other things, three important types of financial institutions. Venture capital firms, hedge funds, and private equity firms. I've never been invited to any of these places. Venture capitalists make risky investments in young companies in exchange for stock, board seats, and other forms of influence. Most investments fail, but the winners pay off big when that company goes public. Now in the 80s, venture capital grew from around $100 million a year to $4 billion. And it's since exploded even more, with firms expected to manage $1.3 trillion worth of assets this year alone. Hedge funds are pooled investment funds from rich people and institutional investors, including pension funds. Their managers tend to make riskier bets, often on non-traditional assets like real estate. Now, the hedge fund market boomed in the 90s and today controls $4 trillion in assets. 
private equity firms buy existing companies using a combination of investor money, frequently pension funds, and massive amounts of debt, which they usually transfer to the company they've bought. Typically, they'll restructure those companies, you know, do things like cut jobs. Then they wait for the stock to go up and sell it, now often weaker and smaller, for massive rewards. It's kind of like if you bought a sandwich and you cut the sandwich into quarters, and then you spit in those quarters, and then you sold the sandwich for way more than you paid for the sandwich to begin with. I don't know if that's a good analogy. I don't understand money. I don't have any of it, but I do have sandwiches. Though these firms usually only put in one to 2% of their own money, they reap 20% of the profits if they reach certain thresholds. Now, back in 2000, private equity firms owned 4% of the economy. By 2021, that number was closer to 20%. And I, for one, think it's good that private financial institutions own 20% of the wealth in the economy. I think that's a good thing. I like it. For anyone who's like, oh, he's woke, commie, Marxist, whatever. Uh-uh, this is what gets me off. As finance was getting deregulated, so was Hollywood. While regulation of suspected entertainment monopolies was strict in the mid 20th century, my main man Ronald Reagan effectively stopped enforcing antitrust rules, giving free reign for studios to take over every process of filmmaking and also of broadcast television, radio, etc. Now, Hollywood quickly reconstituted as a small group of huge conglomerates making increasingly stuff. Relax, amigo. You wanna talk? We'll talk. I'm a sucker for good conversation. Now, increased finance investment in Hollywood in the 80s and 90s led to Wall Street's influence on studios. Something similar happened in journalism, hitting hardest during the digital era, as the online advertising model became unsustainable. This led to seeking outside investments and even full-on buyouts, and equity firms ending up with editorial influence. Today, finance's encroachment on media and entertainment has led to a decrease in quality and massive financial losses. But this still doesn't explain why Wile E. Coyote got canned, Willow was removed from streaming, and there are no longer websites that I can use to construct my whole personality. And it definitely doesn't explain why all this investment and acquisition made everything worse. Most guys I know who work in mergers and acquisitions really don't like it. Now, we'll get into this after the break, but first, I wanted to give a shout out to this video sponsor, our patrons. This one doesn't have a business sponsor on it, so we wanted to thank our patrons for all their support and what they do for our channel. Now, in case you didn't know, we have a Patreon. There's a link in the description, and it's the best way for you to support what we're doing. And to be honest, in this digital media landscape, we need all the support we can get. But hey, we're not asking for a handout because when you join our Patreon, you get videos early without ads, access to our exclusive podcast, Behind the Crack, extra research deep dives, blooper videos, extra philosophy deep dives with me, access to our, our Discord server, and so much more. If you do just wanna give us a handout though, we have a $1 level, which is a really easy way for you to throw us a buck uh, to help us do what we're doing. If you sign up for a whole year, it's like $10.80. So, you know, think about it. That's all I'm asking. Okay, now let's get back to how the finance bros are killing your favorite shows just to spite you. And maybe soon they'll kill your favorite YouTube posts. So if there's suspicious circumstances around my death, I want you guys to look into it. I want you to avenge my death is what I'm saying. Wall Street investment firms are notoriously shadowy about how they influence the businesses they buy. Or maybe sunny shadowy, given the way a typical Blackstone press release describes one new 49% acquisition of three Hollywood studios. Quote, our business is driven by investing thematically in sectors with powerful secular tailwinds. And there is no better example of that than content creation in Los Angeles. I, I create content in Los Angeles and I have no idea what any of that means. I'm all, oh, sorry, I got an email. It seems like it's from corporate. I should look at this. Well, um, I guess this video is now brought to you by Blackstone. Um, they've just acquired Wisecrack and, and our parent company. So those are my bosses now. Um, so shout, shout out to them for all the work they do. And you know, from here on out, our channel's values are gonna revolve around uh, market shares, di dividends, I think, stuff, stuff like that. Now, the best account of what happens when your company is taken over by private equity is a deleted Deadspin article written by the site's former editor-in-chief, Megan Greenwell, on her last day of employment. And there's a link to that in the description. Also, could you imagine doing work on your last day 
of employment. I think the, the last time I got laid off on my last day, I got day drunk on margaritas and then sat in the beanbag room for a while applying for other jobs. Yes, it was a startup and yes, there was a beanbag room. Greenwell writes that the tragedy of digital media isn't that it's run by ruthless, profiteering guys in ill-fitting suits. It's that the people posing as the experts know less about how to make money than their employees to whom they won't listen. It's still a killer business. The platform, the brands, uh, ethos and culture are leading edge. And um, in my view, it's fixable. All they need is adults in the room. But here at Wisecrack, I listen to the experts at Blackstone because they've shown a proven track record of creating wealth for shareholders. Blackstone, it's what's for dinner. Greenwell describes the way the new adult CEO, Jim Spanfeller, and his very adult team of freshly hired C-suite bros tried to intimidate reporters out of writing potentially controversial stories and drove out top staff with condescension, sexism, and immature rudeness. You think they'd pick you over me with your track record? She describes how Spanfeller obsessed over page views, demanding first that the site double, then quadruple them. Despite page views being an inferior performance metric, as compared to time spent on site. In other strategic moves, Spanfeller implemented cumbersome slideshows to artificially up page views and plastered the site with obnoxious ads. Now, Greenwell talks about how Spanfeller wanted the site to achieve growth by being all things to all people, rather than maintaining its distinct point of view. She wonders of his firm, why did they buy a bunch of publications they seem to hate? I know that, that Blackstone bought us because they love the work that we do. I bet they saw our video, Who Needs CEOs? And they were like, we must have them. This perfectly encapsulates what journalist Ed Zitron calls the rot economy, where investors focus on, as he writes, one truly noxious metric over all else, growth. Growth in this case is not necessarily about being bigger or better. It is simply more. In other words, the product is almost irrelevant, which is why Deadspin's new owners could give a flying f about the site's voice or editorial quality. Greenwell notes that her new boss didn't merely want to grow profits, but do so as quickly as possible. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. This makes sense in the case of private equity firms, which by definition don't have interest in the long-term health of the company because their goal is to sell them off for profit and to do it fast. These fever dreams of infinite scale are why publications like Pitchfork, which has a loyal audience that has checked its homepage every morning since the late 90s, was folded into GQ, which increasingly exists to serve sponsored content. Though insiders told news site Semaphore the Pitchfork often had first or second place in homepage traffic at all of Condé Nast, it simply didn't have the potential to scale. Scale isn't just a worry for indie-ish outlets like Pitchfork. It's a constant concern for a Goliath like Netflix, which despite gracing investors with its ascent to industry dominance, saw its stock value collapse by over 60% in 2022 when it lost subscribers for the first time in over a decade. That year it reported net profits of $4.492 billion, down from the previous year to be sure, but I mean, it's hardly anything to sneeze at. Let me know in the comments if you would sneeze at $4.5 billion, or even better, what you would do for four and a half billion dollars. It responded to investor concerns by laying off hundreds of workers, including a remarkably high number of employees working on projects about people of color. Go figure. Then it caved further to investor pressure and added advertising to its platform. Even after a remarkably successful bounce back year in 2023, it raised prices again once more apparently at the pressure of investors. This pressure largely comes from outside investors' short-term focus on balancing the books, which is why nearly every private buyout or investor strong-arming is accompanied by an immediate round of layoffs. This lowers costs and thus artificially boosts the stock price. And this is true whether you're a Disney Imagineer or among the two out of three reporters at the 100 newspapers owned by hedge fund Alden Global Capital who got fired. Oh, sorry, I got another urgent corporate email. Oh, oh, well, I guess Blackstone, um, yeah, they just sold, they just sold us to Alden Global Capital. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be fine. And I'm sure they're selling us cause, cause they saw how valuable we were and they wanted to sell high. An essential to this short-term thinking is a wholesale aversion to risk. A scholar Andrew DeWard puts it, financial capital now fuels the Hollywood dream factory. The result is something that resembles less a factory floor 
than a trading floor. Hollywood was for a long time a pretty risky investment because audiences, let's be honest, are very freaking fickle. That's changed in large part due to the rise of big data, both the masses of it acquired by streaming platforms and the rise of predictive software that uses data analytics to assess which films will be successful. You can actually check out our video about how algorithms are killing Hollywood to learn more about this. As cinematographer Jake Yurez puts it, movies are bad now because investors have nearly perfected the art of making money off them. And while it's easy to blame audiences, the problem is that even if you wanna see something in theaters, besides a superhero film or a movie where Hugh Grant plays a, a cute little Oompa Loompa, well, you're unlikely to be able to. And that's because the conglomeration of media that began in the 80s means it's practically impossible to get distribution, much less any media attention for your very cool indie film, unless you're backed by one of the six giants. Hey, let's fight that trend. Shout out a very cool indie film that you've liked that's come out recently in the comments, and then the rest of you then watch those movies and and then we're gonna become a part, a part of the solution, I think. This has all led to media companies also behaving like financial institutions. The big six all operate their own venture capital wings where they invest in younger, more creative companies like Disney did in Vice or Time Warner did in Hulu and Bustle, or Hearst did in BuzzFeed. This allows them to stifle competition, siphoning out data about younger demographics, and generally leech off innovative new practices, stifling, or eventually as with Vice, stamping out companies that might offer truly exciting media that people can't find on the Disney Channel. Shout out to all my Disney adults. You know I love you and I'm your boy. I'll see you there in the park where I hang out with adults. This also leaves us with a world full of what DeWard calls derivative media, i.e. media that recycles what we've seen before, either through IP or through aping whatever thing was successful last year. But the most literal way to bank on a previous success is to just buy it, which is why financial institutions have made snapping up film, TV, and music catalogs a major investment priority. With acquisitions ranging from movie catalogs with films like Pulp Fiction and There Will Be Blood, to Katy Perry's <laughs> As Mark Hogan writes for the New York Times, music's new overlords are milking their acquisitions by building extended multimedia universes around songs, many of which were hits in the Cold War. Think concerts starring holographic versions of long-dead musicians, TV tie-ins, and splashy celebrity biopics. The latter is especially offensive to me because I really hate music biopics, um, but I'm excited about how there's potentially, I guess, uh, a Grateful Dead movie that Scorsese is making where Jonah Hill is gonna play Jerry Garcia. I don't think it's gonna happen, but it'd be cool if it did. Although I don't love Jonah Hill, so let me know in the comments who you think, contemporary actor, that, that could play uh, Jerry Garcia. Intellectual property was invented as a concept to protect innovators, including artists, but now it's being leveraged to create massive wealth for a small group of people and to fuel bad and derivative art. And this is all to say nothing of the way in which this concentration of wealth is gutting the middle class of the creative workforce, the signs of which we're seeing in the waves of Hollywood strikes. But when this logic moves beyond entertainment, it can put our very lives at stake. I'm not exaggerating, I'm going to explain it to you in a second, but first, I wanna talk about something that's even more high stakes, which is the fact that we also stream. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, we have a show called Wisecrack Live. It's Wednesdays at 10 a.m. It's hosted by who, who, oh yeah, me and my buddy producer Henry. We also stream on Mondays. What's that one called? A Case of the Mondays. Or there in both cases, 10 a.m. Pacific time, Monday and Wednesday. We talk about stuff, read things, watch things, explore ideas. Have a great time in the chat. Shout out to all my green usernames. Uh, we have a really great chat, really nice community. And I would love to have you come hang out there and you know get to know you a little bit better. So next time you're at work on a Monday or a Wednesday, screw your boss, watch our stream instead. I'll see you there. Just click all the bells and stuff and, it, and, and the internet will tell you, okay? But let's get back to it as things in this video are about to get way worse because this doesn't stop with media acquisition. These same financiers are increasingly getting involved in industries that determine whether people live or die. By 2014, staff was stretched thin when an expansion project doubled the hospital's capacity and the private equity-backed firm in charge of handling staff refused to add more doctors. Private equity has increased its investment in healthcare more than 20 times over since 2000, pouring $1 trillion into the sector over the past decade. Today, around 40% of for-profit hospitals are owned by private equity. Now, when private equity takes over hospitals, the focus is on short-term profits, which means immediate cost cutting, even at the expense of patients' health. 
Could you imagine that that was your job? You know, your business buys a hospital and you have to go to the hospital and be like, where could we save money? I get that we all gotta make a living. You know, I do this, it's not honorable, but that one would be tough. The first step is usually layoffs, resulting in understaffed hospitals where doctors are frequently replaced with lower level nurses to minimize costs. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, these hospitals have 25% more avoidable health complications, ranging from a 27% increase in falls to a doubling of surgical infection rates, which as I know from watching Scrubs is really bad and that's how most people die in the hospital. Even though these places end up actually costing consumers more. And that's because these hospitals are only incidentally there to fix your broken arm or, you know, give your dad a life-saving heart transplant because they're primarily there to be gutted and resold for profit. Private equity also owns 11% of all nursing homes in America. Despite the fact that a 2021 study estimated nursing homes owned by these firms caused over 20,000 premature deaths over a 12 year period, likely due to decreased nursing availability due to, you guessed it, cost cuts. But hey, as you saw in our video last week, none of us have to worry about dying in a nursing home because we'll never get to retire. So we'll just die checking out groceries when we're 91, we'll just collapse on the scanner. Alarmingly, these nursing homes have a 50% higher rate of antipsychotic drug prescriptions, perhaps to compensate for decreased care. And such drugs are associated with higher mortality rates for elderly folks. Meanwhile, their owners seem more concerned with selling real estate for quick budget balancing than, you know, actually investing in the people they're supposed to be caring for. But this isn't just an issue for our grandparents, as these same firms are also buying up single family homes at a rapid pace. Since the housing crisis of 2008, private equity firms have been hoovering up abandoned single family homes to the point where estimates suggest institutional investors might own 40% of rental homes by 2030. With a special focus on the most popular locales and the baby boomer happy Sunbelt states, they've successfully helped drive up rental prices 43% in Phoenix, 35% in Atlanta, and 44% in Tampa. I've been to Tampa a couple times, People there are a little bit weird. They're fun, but they're weird. While certainly not the only problem behind America's housing crisis, it's impossible to argue that it's not making things a lot worse. Even mobile home parks are being snapped up by private equity firms, sometimes even via government subsidized loans. Now, my uncle John Oliver did a great piece on this back in the day that's worth revisiting. Over 100,000 home sites traditionally run by mom and pop businesses are now owned or partly owned by private equity firms like these. The most horrifying point might be that mobile homeowners typically rent the property upon which their home sits. Now, private firms will come in and drastically increase rent on that property, leaving residents essentially trapped on their lot, forced to permanently pay higher rent or fork up the necessary $10,000 to relocate their home. And because their credit scores frequently render them ineligible for reasonable 15 or 30 year loans on the land, they're often forced to take out high interest chattel loans against their personal property just to scrape by. Now what's so disturbing is that these firms run a hospital or a mobile home park the same way they run a streaming platform because it's not about the product. In fact, it's never been about the product. It's only about the profit. And based on everything we know about how private equity firms operate, it's maybe no surprise that even as these firms earn massive profits, roughly 20% of their acquired companies go bankrupt within a decade, making them 10 times more likely to go under than your average company. Wait, since we got acquired twice since I started this video, does that mean we're 20 times more likely to go under? That, that, can't, that can't be the case. And while the failure of a food delivery app or a streaming service might not wreck your life, if this same pattern of failure fully takes over healthcare, housing, education, or other necessary services, we're setting ourselves up to be culturally, socially, and medically American psychoed. But hey, what do you guys think? Uh, is Wall Street to blame for media's woes? Is the pursuit of endless growth and endless profit ruining our society? Or are we just being, you know, haters that are hating on the rich and Wall Street when we should just get in line and learn from them? Let us know what you think in the comments. A huge thanks as always to all of you for watching our videos, watching our streams, consuming our content, commenting, liking, subscribing, sharing, all those things. They really mean a lot. They help us a lot, so thank you. And of course, a huge shout out to all of our patrons. A special shout out to anyone who wasn't a patron when they started this video, but you are by the end of it. That's amazing, and I love you very much. But hey, 
It's been a big day. We got acquired twice. Uh, I got an email about how I have to go to a meeting to discuss the future of my role and how there's like, you know, a necessity to reduce cost and how I might be better served someplace else. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, so I'll definitely be back here and I'll see you next week. Until then, have a good one.